Welcome to Hong Kong Review 2022. Over the past year, our city saw major changes on political, social and economic fronts. A number of high-profile court cases since the enactment of the national security law. The city gradually came out of the COVID-19 epidemic as outbound and inbound travel restrictions changed. Here's a look back at Hong Kong in 2022. The epidemic raged on. At the end of last year, after returning to Hong Kong, the crew of a Cathay Pacific cargo flight went out during the home quarantine period, causing multiple transmission chains, including a cluster linked to the Moon Palace. Among them, a flight attendant visited a pharmacy in Tun Mun. Authorities suspected there was a hidden transmission chain in that area. Thus, many places were included in the compulsory testing notice, causing long queues in testing centres. About 600 people had already lined up to wait for the tests, even before the doors opened. By 10 p.m., there's still a long queue. The epidemic continued to spread. A clerk and customers of this pet store were infected. Authorities found coronavirus in hamsters and decided to put down more than 2,000 hamsters in all pet stores. They also recommended people who had bought hamsters after December the 22nd to hand over the hamsters for humane extermination. At the same time, the Omicron B8.2 subtype, which is more contagious, was there. A Pakistani woman was infected during the quarantine period after arriving in Hong Kong. She returned home and infected nine family members living under the same roof. Her son then infected school teachers and classmates. Transmission chains also appeared in Sham Shou Po and Kwai Chung Estate, where her husband had visited. Authorities sealed off five buildings in Kwai Chung and enforced inspections. Residents of Yat Kwai House and Ying Kwai House had to be grounded for seven days for the first time in Hong Kong. The very first target of our work must be to prevent the collapse of our healthcare system. We have been very successful there. Our healthcare system is still working relatively normally. The Lunar New Year was barely festive. Instead, many districts were sealed off and inspected, yet there were still outbreaks. A large number of patients were sent to the hospital. The medical system collapsed. With temperatures as low as 10 degrees and rain, patients had to wait outside the hospital overnight. There were seniors paralyzed on the bed, holding tears and relying on blankets for warmth. There were parents comforting sick children and also a mother who had to share a bed with her son. The epidemic continued. During the peak period, there were more than 10,000 new confirmed cases in Hong Kong every day. On March 3rd, 76,000 confirmed cases were recorded. Not only was there a lack of hospital beds, with nearly 300 deaths a day at the time, even the mortuary was full. The bodies of the deceased were stranded in the emergency department and wards and were placed next to the elderly patients. Finally, the hospital authority decided to modify the refrigerated container to temporarily store the bodies, but even if they were sent to the mortuary, cremation may not be arranged immediately. Isolation facilities were also seriously insufficient. 
many confirmed patients couldn't be sent to isolation. While waiting, one positive person could infect the whole family and food and medicine supplies began to drop. If you wanted to ask for help, the government hotline cannot be reached. And even if you succeeded, the staff may not be able to help. Meanwhile, many people in isolation facilities wanted to be released but couldn't. When Chief Executive Carrie Lam looked back on the fifth wave, she admitted anti-epidemic work was not perfect, but denied any policy mistakes. When the epidemic was at its worst, the government tightened gathering limits to two people, banned restaurant dining services and cross-family gatherings. Even hair salons were forced to close for a while, as well as shopping malls, markets and places of worship. People had to use the Leave Home Safe app when entering these listed premises. The measures remained in place until the end of the year. At the end of February, authorities implemented vaccine passes again. Vaccination requirements were required to enter all listed premises. In the end, the overall vaccination rate of the second dose has been pushed to 95%, and the third dose, 83 percent. Taking into account reported cases alone, the fifth wave of the epidemic eventually caused more than 2 million infections and over 10,000 deaths. At the beginning of the year, there were voices calling for the SCR government to follow mainland cities to implement mandatory testing for all citizens to achieve zero infection. If you want to do a test, it's about 700 people. 一齊感受。大家可以想像嗰個嘅影響有幾大。呢啲居民嘅日常生活點樣安排咧？嚇，呢個係一個係一個常識嘅問題嚟嘅。But in February, the number of confirmed cases soared. Carrie Lam's attitude changed. 經過中央嘅助力之後咧，推行一個全民強制檢測，希望切斷呢個誒傳播鏈啦。我哋正全面細化方案。Secretary for Food and Health Sophia Chan indicated mandatory testing for all people will be considered in conjunction with the lockdown. Once the news broke out, supermarket shelves were emptied. However, in March, authorities changed their mind again. I wouldn't overlook the reality simply because I made a certain statements. Because the reality is to fight the epidemic and not to do as what the CE has said. Two weeks later, she announced suspending a community-wide mandatory testing. In the end, authorities distributed rapid test kits and called on all citizens in Hong Kong to do three rapid tests on their own during the period from April the 8th to 10th. But in the end, less than 950,000 people responded and some 2,800 confirmed cases were found, far below the estimated 30,000 people. Throughout the first half of the year, the SCL government was challenged on different levels. Chief Executive Kerry Lam admitted the government could no longer handle the epidemic on its own. 為了應對第五波疫情,區政府不斷投入大量的資源,加強各個抗疫環節的能力。
，但係病毒擴散速度之快，已經遠遠超過特區政府自身可以處理嘅能力。At the same time, Chief Secretary for Administration John Lee led a delegation to Shenzhen to ask for the central government's help. The mainland then sent experts, medical teams and testing staff to Hong Kong to help maintain the supply of food and anti-epidemic materials. It also assisted in the construction of makeshift hospitals. All related work was coordinated by John Lee. Welcome back to Hong Kong Review 2022. In the past year, John Lee was elected as the new chief executive. He is the first former police officer from the security branch to rise to the top job. The CE says he adopts results-oriented approach and hopes to start a new chapter for Hong Kong. So, with that approach, what has the CE done to achieve his goals? The epidemic has also triggered a political scandal in the city. Early January, over 200 people attended a banquet to celebrate Hong Kong deputy to the National People's Congress Whitman Hung's birthday. Among them, 15 senior officials. Some of them later tested positive. So, all attendees were sent to quarantine. The then Home Affairs Secretary Casper Cho resigned. Two senior officials, Alan Fong and Vincent Fong, received verbal warnings, while the remaining 12 were not punished. The epidemic also impacted the CE election. Initially, the election was scheduled on March 27th, but it was postponed to May 8th. The nomination period was also rescheduled to April 3rd. Carrie Lam was asked whether she would seek a second term but didn't respond directly. It was only until the second day of the nomination period when she set the record straight. I will not contest uh, in the uh, coming uh, chief executive election. Carrie Lam completed her five-year term of chief executive on June 30th. Two days later, then Chief Secretary for Administration John Lee resigned to run in the CE election. If my resignation is approved by the central people's government, I plan to run in the chief executive election. The CEO has established the goal these are the three policy areas in John Lee's election campaign. His slogan, starting a new chapter for Hong Kong together. This new chapter will be a new symphony. Being the conductor, each member will be able to leverage his or her strengths to create the synergy effect. Together, we will play a more splendid new piece for Hong Kong. John Lee secured 786 nominations from the 1,500 member election committee, exceeding the threshold of 188 nominations, making him the sole candidate in the CE race. I hereby declare that the only candidate, Mr. John Lee Kachu, is returned in the above mentioned election. Congratulations. Thank you. 
His election manifesto was only unveiled nine days prior to the voting day, but he still won 1,416 votes and became the first chief executive under the improved electoral system in Hong Kong with a record voting rate of 99.16%. On May 30th, President Xi Jinping met John Lee in Beijing. John Lee was sworn in as the city's sixth chief executive on July 1st, also the 25th anniversary of the handover. President Xi Jinping came to Hong Kong to attend the ceremony. She also administered the oath for John Lee. I, John Lee Kachu, swear that in the office of Chief Executive of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region of the People's Republic of China. Under the new administration, there are three secretaries of department and 15 directors of bureaus. Lee is the first former police officer from the security branch to rise to the top job. On his first week in office, he set up four working groups on major issues. Deputy Chief Secretary Warner Chuck oversees the working group on district affairs. In August, he launched a program on tackling hygiene black spots. <laughs> John Lee conducted community walkabouts to listen to the people and visited subdivided flat tenants. In October, the CE released his maiden policy address. Solving housing problems tops the agenda. He hopes to increase the land supply to alleviate the problem. The CE introduced the modular integrated construction method to build the simple design, light public housing. He expects 30,000 light public housing will be built within five years. However, the cost of building light public housing is higher than traditional ones. It draws criticism. But the housing chief said its value cannot be judged simply by numbers. John Lee introduced key performance indicators, or KPI, to improve governance efficiency. KPI covers areas including improving hygiene and nurturing a new generation of young people. At the end of December, he rolled out the Youth Development Blueprint, the Primary Healthcare Blueprint, Innovation and Technology Development Blueprint and the new Lantau Tomorrow Plan. On the same week, John Lee went to Beijing for his first duty visit.
Another focus of the new government is national security. I Founder of Next Digital Jimmy Lai faces several charges for conspiracy to encourage foreign sanctions against Hong Kong and China. The High Court approved Jimmy Lai to hire King's counsel Timothy Owen to come to Hong Kong to represent him as the defendant's lawyer. The Department of Justice filed an application to the Court of Final Appeal against the admission of overseas lawyers for national security trials, but that was dismissed by the city's top court. Less than three hours after the court's ruling, the CE said the government will ask Beijing to interpret the national security law. At the present, there is no effective means to ensure that a council from overseas uh, will not have conflict of interest because of his nationality. These underlying threats exist. Jimmy Lai's trial has also been adjourned until next September. Six former Apple Daily senior executives pleaded guilty to breaching the national security law. The verdict will be made after Jimmy Lai's trial ends. Former CEO of Next Digital Chen Kim Hong will be the witness in the prosecution. This year, many activists were also arrested or jailed in relation to anti-government protests or the national security law. Under the new political atmosphere, no one was willing to take up executive committee posts for the Civic Party, once the second largest pro-democracy party. And online news outlets Citizen News, Factwire shut down. Major newspaper Ming Pao was also slammed by the Security Bureau a few times. UN Human Rights Committee grilled the government over the use of the dramatic scope of national security law and urged the government to scrap the law. The SAR government immediately issued a lengthy statement strongly objecting the criticisms. With the epidemic stabilizing, many countries reopened borders and lifted quarantine measures. The mainland is also returning to normalcy. Here in Hong Kong, what have the new administration done to revitalize the city? A roadmap for Hong Kong to return to pre-pandemic normalcy was mapped out in March. The city was preparing to reopen to both overseas and mainland travellers, but a rebound in COVID cases hampered the efforts. Our global competitiveness took a hit and our financial centre ranking dropped to number four, which is lower than our nearest rival, Singapore.
In the second half of March, the fifth wave of the epidemic stabilized. The number of daily infections dropped from a high of 76,000 to 10,000. The government announced relaxing social distancing measures in three phases over a period of three months starting April. The first phase began on April 21st, with some premises finally reopened. Kids had fun in theme parks. Young people spent time in basketball courts. Couples went for movies. A family of four could finally enjoy a dinner on the same table in restaurants. Covid cases continued to drop to around 200. The second phase of relaxation started on May 19th as scheduled. Bars, karaoke lounges and mahjong parlours reopened after some 400 days of closure. Nightlife came alive again in Lan Kwai Fong. Groups of four were allowed to sit together, some danced to celebrate the reopening. Unfortunately, several bar clusters emerged by the end of May. Covid cases went back up to 500. The government halted the third phase of relaxation, which was scheduled in June. Customers entering bars were even required to show negative RAT results valid within 24 hours. That practice was only cancelled at the end of this year. Apart from changing social distancing measures, the government continued to boost vaccination rate in Hong Kong by launching the vaccine pass early this year. In 2022, the city's vaccination rate increased drastically. The second dose vaccination rate reached a high of 95 percent. The third dose stood at 83 percent. However, the police discovered some doctors were issuing false vaccination exemption certificates. In September, some doctors and residents who purchased the records in question were arrested. Authorities invalidated some 20,000 bogus exemption certificates. A citizen sought judicial review to challenge the government. He won the appeal. After losing the case, the government amended laws to grant the health secretary powers to invalidate vaccination exemption certificates suspected to have been issued without prior medical assessment. In the beginning of the year, Hong Kong was preparing to resume cross-border travels with the mainland, but the epidemic worsened. Many cross-boundary families were separated by the Shenzhen River due to the travel restrictions. Initially, travellers entering Shenzhen from Hong Kong must stay in a quarantine hotel for 14 days, followed by a week of home isolation. In June, the hotel quarantine period was shortened to seven days and home surveillance three days, also known as 7 plus 3. In November, it was further cut to 5 plus 3, but it was still difficult to book a room at a quarantine hotel. <laughs> In April, the government scrapped the flight suspension mechanism, allowing passenger planes from countries, including the UK and US, to fly to Hong Kong. It also shortened the hotel quarantine period to seven days, but some still criticised the rules were too harsh. In August, the new administration introduced the Red and Amber Health Code system to restrict the movement of international arrivals depending on their COVID status. It also shortened the seven-day quarantine period to three days of hotel quarantine and four days of medical surveillance. Within those four days, people will hold an Amber Health Code, during which they can go to school, work and department stores, but they cannot dine in. In September, the government further relaxed rules to zero plus three, effectively scrapping quarantine for international arrivals.
as Hong Kong was implementing Zero Plus Three, popular travel destinations such as Japan and Taiwan also opened to travelers. Many Hong Kongers were so happy to finally fly out of the city. Outbound travels rebounded after Zero Plus Three took effect for a month, but non-local inbound travelers only increased by 9%. At least five large-scale exhibitions, such as jewelry and French wine exhibitions, moved to Singapore. There's finally some good news in December. Hong Kong removed most COVID restrictions locally, dropping PCR tests for arrivals, vaccine pass, quarantine for close contacts, leaving only mask requirements. We have always been preparing for us progressing towards normalization. People have seen uh, how this is being implemented. So it is not rapid, it's not sudden. Uh, there will always come a day when we have to make big decision about normalization. That is exactly what we are doing now. The central government announced that cross-border restrictions between Hong Kong and the mainland, which has been in place for three years, will be lifted in January. Three years into the pandemic, 130 international enterprises moved their headquarters out of Hong Kong. The floor area of vacant offices was three times more than before. And Hong Kong slipped to the fourth place in the Global Financial Centers Index, lagging behind Singapore. Not only enterprises left, but also talents. Up until October, the turnover rate among doctors were 8.1 percent, nurses 10.7 percent. 2,100 teachers were lost in the 2022-23 academic year. The increment was 70 percent year on year. In the third quarter, the city's labor force stood at 3.78 million. That's 190,000 less than the same period three years ago. In his policy address, John Lee launched the Top Talent Pass scheme, hoping to attract some 35,000 foreign talents each year. He said the focus is to tell good stories of Hong Kong. Two weeks later, the Global Financial Leaders Investment Summit was held in Hong Kong, even when the strong wind signal number eight was issued. The government was hoping to promote Hong Kong via the summit. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Global Over 200 financial international financiers came to Hong Kong, marking it the largest financial event held in Hong Kong since the COVID outbreak. Oh, I see the wind and rain outside, uh, and, but I think it's an acknowledgement of the very important role that you all are playing in the global financial sector. The Rugby Sevens also resumed in Hong Kong. Fans were allowed to eat and drink at the stadium. John Lee also attended the tournament. He also took off his mask to have a drink. In December, China unveiled 10 new guidelines to ease COVID restrictions, and there was not a word on the dynamic zero policy. Under the two systems, demographics, healthcare systems, and the immune barriers, and the economy vary from place to place, so we adopt different measures. Four days later, the government lifted some more restrictions. The scanning of Leave Home Safe app was scrapped, but people still need to present their vaccine passes before entering restaurants. The Amber Health Code was also scrapped. Once incoming travelers test negative on the day of arrival, they are free to walk around the city. Welcome. Many think their relaxation came a little too late, but Lo Chung Mao said there is a lot to consider before making such decisions.
On December 28th, the chief executive scrapped all measures except for the mask requirement. We have very good confidence that we can control the risk because the medical service has enhanced its response system and also we have sufficient and effective medicine and the community has good experience over three years to protect themselves and Hong Kong people as a whole are very compliant with our measures and I thank them sincerely. Still, some businesses have already closed down before things got back to normal. Welcome back. In this last section of Hong Kong Review 2022, we'll look back at some major incidents and certain milestones involving our public transport and infrastructure. That includes MTR blunders, the opening of the Hong Kong Palace Museum and the airport's third runway. Also, a new legislative council with 90 members. On January 3rd, members of the 7th Legislative Council were sworn in. For the first time, members had to sing the national anthem before taking the oath of office. Inside the chamber, both the SCR and the national emblem was put up. I, Cheng Yu Yan Tommy, swear by Almighty God. Among the 90 lawmakers, 56 are first timers, and only one of them is not from the pro establishment camp. Chinese universities attempt to change its school emblem and Google's refusal to put the Chinese national anthem at the top of its search results were among the topics widely discussed. 2009, of the 25 bills submitted by the administration, 17 were passed. That includes the rental enforcement moratorium, the copyright ordinance and abolishing the MPF offsetting mechanism, a hotly debated bill over the past 20 years. During an Asia Rugby Sevens match involving the city's team held in Incheon in South Korea, a song associated with the 2019 anti-government protests was played instead of the Chinese national anthem. 一定要守集證據, Among other notable events, a fire on a major power line in Yunlong led to a district wide power outage. Cutting off street lights, mobile signals, and train services. It took CLP more than 10 hours to restore power supply. In November, a train on the MTR Chunwan line derailed. 
Sending off a couple doors and 150 passengers into evacuation on the pitch dark train track. Services were suspended for over 12 hours. Commuters had to take buses until services returned to normal the next morning. Yet within just one month, there was another incident. An emergency failure of a coupler halted a train on the Chengkwano line. Some 1,500 passengers were evacuated during the morning rush hour. Services between Tu King Leng and Po Lam or Lohas Park were suspended for four hours. Tu King Leng Station was the only functioning MTR station in the district. People either had to walk to the station or queue for buses. A lack of visitors during the pandemic led Jumbo Kingdom, the floating restaurant in Aberdeen, to shut its doors for good. It had to leave Hong Kong in June as its maritime license expired. Just four days after leaving Hong Kong waters, the vessel ran into trouble in the choppy sea. The kingdom eventually sank. And after spending 23 years in Hong Kong, Panda An An suffered from poor health and was put down at the age of 35. Here are some of the familiar faces who left us this year. There were several fatal industrial and construction accidents this year. In Samaoping, a 65-ton crane fell and hit multiple container offices. Some workers were trapped under the crane, causing three deaths and six injuries. Police said it would get to the bottom of the matter, but that didn't offer any relief to relatives. I don't know why it was so 警察也好,很多專業的人士都去找那個原因。但是那個原因對我個人來說是沒有意義的。The worst crane accident in 20 years drew a lot of attention to work safety. Yet in December, there were three fatal incidents in a row. A worker fell from a three-meter-high scaffolding. A 55-year-old worker was crushed to death by a metal bar. In Kwai Chong, another worker died from a gas explosion. Two dancers performing at a concert of Canto Pop boy band Mirror were hit by a falling LED panel. One of the dancers, Mo Li, suffered spinal injury and remains hospitalized till this day. 
After three months of investigation, authorities arrested five staff members of the contractor who allegedly falsified the weight of the LED panel concerned. The opening of several infrastructure brought life to the city. The East Rail's Cross Harbour Line drew 2,000 fans on its first day of service. After 10 years of work, the East Rail Line Cross Harbour extension finally commenced services. It only takes 7 minutes, down from 19 minutes before, to travel from Hong Hum to Admiralty. But the shorter platform meant the number of train compartments had to be shortened from 12 to 9. The MTR says it will increase frequencies to compensate for the 25% capacity reduction. <laughs> Gone with the old and in comes the new. The MTI decided to phase out a 40-year-old M train and replace them with a Q train. The Chungkwan Old Lamptin Tunnel and Cross Bay Bridge opened in December, alleviating traffic congestion for 400,000 residents in Chungkwan Old. There's also a pedestrian walkway and bicycle lanes on the bridge. The Hong Kong Palace Museum opened to public in July. Five of the nine halls are thematic exhibition showcasing more than 900 treasures from the Forbidden City. Among them, 166 of them are Grade 1 national artifacts. Sam, Yi, Yat. The airport's third runway started operation. By 2024, the entire system will be completed and passenger capacity is set to increase by 50% to 120 million. Cargo throughput is looking to go up to 10 million tons. As we ring in 2023, there's much anticipation for both the rebound of the economy and the reopening of our border crossings with the mainland. From every one of us at TVB Pearl, have a great year ahead.